Hello, I'm Denise Goff and I'm an actress living in London. Very happy to be here. Thanks, Mark. Hi, Denise. Such a pleasure to talk to you and I have to come clean. I've um, I've um, missed our date for <laughs> the last couple of weeks, so I apologise for that. Covid has made calendars very fluid, so I'm so thrilled that, that you've oh, been no. here. I'm really happy to be here and I was only talking to somebody about that this morning that boundaries around work times and all of that have gone out the window for people like my agent was saying that she has agent friends of hers that are like taking phone calls from clients on Sundays and stuff and she was like what has happened we've all there's no we're still finding our feet aren't we with with um timings and yeah. so don't worry, for be me as an actor, I'm doing nothing. So <laughs> I... <laughs> Apart from putting up gorgeous Christmas trees, that's, you know, again, I must say. This you know... was, it's for everybody. I thought, because I was moving around the room, I was thinking, where will I sit? And even though the light is better somewhere else, I thought we deserved you know, a little I, bit of Christmas cheer. I think, you know, it's one of the first interviews where I'm looking at my stark white lighting and going, God, look at yours, you know. Yeah. You're the interviewer. That's yeah, what it's meant to be. No, anyway. <laughs> Come here to me. Thanks a million for taking part in this. Um, I'm interested in most of these. We've kind of gone back to to people's origins, but it's kind of very easy to put narratives back on things. But I'm just fascinated. I mean, originally from Ennis, big family. Yeah. Well, I was born in Wexford, actually, okay. in New Ross, County Wexford. And then we moved to Ennis when I was five. And then I lived there for 10 years and then I came here. So, yes, I'm one of 11 children. Wow. Um, so it's really no wonder I've ended up spending my life on stages where everybody has to clap for me after everything I say. And where do you come in the, in, in the 11? Lucky number seven. Oh, so you're right in the right. middle? Pretty much in the middle, yeah. And do you have, <laughs> are, are, yeah. You, are you a middle child? <laughs> yeah, pretty, I mean, my brother Jared is the actual middle child and then me, but yeah, I'm definitely... Yeah, definitely. And in a family that size, there's like five families in one, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Wow. And can I ask what, what was the age range? Like, what, what's kind of, like... So, there's 30 years, I think. So, my eldest brother is now 54, I think. Okay. I have to be careful because yeah, I don't have to, you know... You don't have to expose people, it's fine. <laughs> and, then, and then Kelly and Kira, the youngest. So, Shane is 54, and yeah, the youngest... Are 34? Oh my god, so it's 20 years. Wow. Okay. So pretty much every year and a half there was a baby. Wow. Okay. Um yep. and then like I suppose it's a stupid question, but I mean I was gonna say was there any drama in the house, but obviously your house was full of drama. <laughs> but, but, but like how like would you looking back now, you know, at the career you've kind of entered and kind of, you know, thriving in. Back then, was that, you know, as, as, as a young girl, was there kind of a sense, looking back now, that that was always in the cards, or? No, not really. I mean, I, I knew I loved being on stage. Like, I did a couple of school plays and stuff, and then there was a really brilliant teacher. I, I mean, she, um, her name was Lord O'Donoghue, and uh, she, I would go to a little drama class in her house, in her, I think it was actually in her bedroom in, uh, in Ennis. And we would do that once a week. And she told me I was, I was really good. I remember she made me a medal once and she had engraved my name on the back and it just said excellence and then my name. And I remember thinking, oh my God. Uh, yeah, I think I, I always, knew that for me it was never about movies either it was really specifically to stage okay. it was when I got on stage whatever happened in that school hall when I was on the stage I just felt the most free and the most kind of myself that I had ever okay and we were you were you, yeah. were you kind of was there were you a reader like what was it kind of did you live like you know was there Oh, I was a total fantasist as a yeah. child. Okay. I mean, like beyond fantasist. I lived as a little boy for, I think, a couple of years. I was called Richard and I was called Richard after the actor who played MacGyver. So I wasn't just MacGyver. I was Richard Dean Anderson who played MacGyver. So, I mean, for a kid to be doing that, I see it in my little nephew now. He's the way I was. 
like you I completely became I had like little bits of stuff that I might need for bombs and stuff in my pockets all the time and and then I decided very very clearly that I was going to be a girl and I was going to play with dolls because I had very I remember I had very short hair so I sort of and I was always mistaken for a little boy during that whole time. So I was obviously really good at being Richard Dean yes, Anderson. Um, but then there's, I think I saw, I saw a photo of myself not long ago and I had a real remembrance of deciding to hold this doll. I didn't really play with dolls. I, I liked bikes and building stuff and I liked being away from the house. Um, <laughs> pretending I was always pretending you know but I remember deciding oh I have to be a girl and girls play with dolls and they play with Barbies and but I would do things like it was the time when dolls had those glass eyes with the the, oh, yeah. la the eyelashes or the eyelids that would flick up and down so I would pluck out their eyes and I would have a little bag of, or a little collection of glass eyes in my pockets like I was and I hadn't made the connection that the dolls would then have no eyes <laughs> and they cut their hair and I think obviously think it was going to grow back and I remember d being really clearly like playing with Barbies and thinking what is this I don't understand why I'm holding this plastic thing that can't do anything when you could just pretend to be it yourself and then I, I remember once pretending to be French and so I was very very small I could only have been six or seven and I was walking around the estate that we lived on and there was some builders working on a house a few doors up from ours. And I went up to the builders. I even remember what I was wearing and everything. And I went up to the builders and I said, uh, excuse me, I'm very sorry, but uh, I, am to, uh, I am to look for the shop. There is some a shop. And the builder was like, oh yeah, definitely now. The shop is down there and you go down to the end of the road and you turn right, that, you know, that doing the shouting and shouting because I was French. And, uh, and he said, will you buy us all some ice creams up here and buy one for yourself? <laughs> so I skipped off down the road going, oh my God, being French is amazing. <laughs> bought, an ice, bought all the ice creams, came back. And when I came back, they had moved from the front of the house to the back of the house. So I had to go around the side of the house to give them the ice creams. But on the way, the owner of the house, Mrs. White, came out and in front of all the builders said, Denise Goff, what are you doing around here? And I had to stand there and I was trying to speak really quietly so that the builders would But I'd also, I'll never forget that when I then handed the ice creams to the builders, they were so bewildered. It wasn't a look of, it was like they were trying to work out what this little child had done. <laughs> I was that good at pretending to wow. be good. Um, so, yeah. And come here, in relation to Richard, like was, was it you calling yourself Richard or did you ask the other people to call you Richard? Like, was Oh it... yeah, people had to call me Richard. Oh wow, okay. Yeah, Rich yeah, it was, it was pretty, um, I, I was pretty serious. But then I remember being on a beach once in Spanish Point doing cartwheels on the beach and I was trying really hard to get the perfect cartwheel and I cartwheeled finally a really good one and there were it's like something out of Father Ted this and there was three nuns with their habits on and everything sitting on the rocks and they went good boy yourself and I turned around to the nuns and I said I'm a fucking girl and that's I think when I decided I was going to be a girl because I sort of thought no, no, I don't. I, I, I wanted to be in control of my image. <laughs> yeah, pretty early days to do that, and good you did it then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so then there was. I just I, I made up worlds for myself to live in. I remember at night time, especially, like I'd sit up all night. In there'd be times my mom would come in in the morning, and I'd have been up all night, like in some other place, like making up a yeah. whole. You know. And did you ever write them down? Did you ever kind of put pen to paper on them at all? Yeah, but then I remember, oh God, I'd, I get quite dark though as a child as well. You know, I was always very obsessive about, I was very obsessed with the Holocaust and I was very obsessed with uh, when the Gulf War happened and America wanted to use Shannon Airport as an arms base. And I was obsessed with this. And so I wrote to Saddam Hussein 
to ask him to meet me like would you meet me and just discuss this with me this you need to understand what the like if I had known the word ramifications yeah, I would have yeah. used that word in my letter but I would sit up having conversations about I mean it's actually quite a lot to think that a little girl was so I was catastrophizing and thinking that I had to fix everything so um so it wasn't it was there was a, a lot of kind of fun of it but there was it, it's also quite an obsessive and kind of scary for a little kid so yeah I would write I would write poetry but then somebody read my poetry book once and told me I shouldn't write poems like that and when you do that with a kid it had it has affected how I write even to this day the idea like if I have journals I've said I recently lost a friend of mine and after he died we had to go to his flat you know and clear out all his stuff and I remember saying to his sister okay if I die because I live alone I was like if I die I'm putting all my journals in a box and like they are to be burned nobody is to be going through my stuff you know so I still have a thing about people reading um my private thoughts yeah no it's funny I had a sim similar we I kind of over the last few years I kind of I'm a, I'm a book hoarder and it's buying lo loads of books <gasps> but I yeah but I also kind of also write bits and pieces of things on pages and then kind of but I stuff them in, into books and I kind of had this I was sitting at home uh, last year sitting in front of the bookcase going god if I die and someone is clearing and even my kids are clearing out my house you're kind of going I, I can't remember what, I, what I've written. I can't remember what. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And some of it is like, you know, I work with somebody who always encourages me to like, let the child in you, you know, when you have a rough day or when there's, let the child in you rant. And yeah. so you give space to all your deepest, darkest. And some of, like you see yeah. some of the writing, you think I'm gonna, oh my God, if people saw it, it's vile. Yeah. And I don't want that like, and also now that I'm sort of, you know, I'm kind of a more public figure. So can yeah. you imagine, you know, the actress Denise Goff after yeah. she died and they found Here we go, her. Here's her files. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but then I'd be dead. So maybe I wouldn't care. I think we're both probably going to, after this chat, both probably kind of going to go to the bookshelf going. <laughs> Getting the books yeah. and getting the journals and putting them somewhere safe. Come here, yeah. was there was there a sense of as you kind of progressed then into you know secondary school and that sense of I mean you, you sorry you sang I mean there was a serious yeah. there. I sang, I trained as like a soprano, I trained it like basically as an opera singer, mm. um for a few years from the age of nine to fourteen, and. Oh God, I hated opera. I Because it, you have to be so perfect in opera. Like you can't miss a note in opera. So it's it's anxiety inducing. And, uh, and bless her, my teacher then turned out to be, she was caught drink driving. I think she killed someone when she was um, drink driving. And, and the wife of the person she killed asked that she go to rehab rather than, so there's a lot of drama around me um so yeah i i went to secondary school but i i sort of stopped going to school when i was about 14 15 so like i really only wanted to be in in secondary school because in fourth year they they did a play and i wanted to be in the play and i didn't stick around for long enough to do it so it had got, it had got that serious in relation to performing at, at that stage it was kind of like that was kind of you know very important to you it was very important to me, but by that stage, I was also, you know, I was an, inc I was a very wayward teen, you know, I, I had a lot of um, difficulties. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have a good time in school, in primary school, I had a horrible time with the nuns, unfortunately, except for one beautiful nun who I stayed in touch with until she died, who was incredible and just thank God for her because I had a couple of real, um, like it wouldn't be allowed to happen now yeah. being told certain things about yourself yeah. when you're a little girl you know or a little boy you just wouldn't it wouldn't be allowed now but it unfortunately it was allowed then and so I sort of started really going off the rails when I was about 12 or 13 and then by the time I was 15 I was done I was yeah. um so so 
as much as I could romanticize my story and say, you know, I ran away to go and be an actress in London. That's kind of the Hollywood version. But actually it was, I was a terrified, very, um, uh, I don't really like to say broken, but I was in need of repair. Yeah. And that's in, incredible, you know, I mean, in your mid twenties, that's a brave thing to do, you know, move from Ennis to London for whatever reason. But when you're 15, 16, you know, that, that, that sense of, and finding yourself then eventually in the Academy of, you know, uh, of life yeah. and arts. But I think, and when you hit there, when you kind of reach that space or reach that, you know, time, was that kind of a homecoming for you? Like, did you feel like, you know, when you kind of find yourself, a lot of actors that I've spoken to, when they find themselves in training or in a stage school, they kind of, A, could get terrified, but also feel at home in some ways that they kind of, they've met their tribe or was, that, was there kind of a moment there for you that? Well, I'll tell you what it was for me was that nobody believed, apart from my aunt Michelle, who lived in London, who was such an incredible, I look back now and I think, God, even when I was trying to steal from her, um, she was always on my side, always. It didn't matter how bold I was, she, believed in me and when I was 16 she took me for my 16th birthday to the Royal Shakespeare Company and afterwards she found out where the actors drank the dirty dock I think where they still drink and she brought me there and she pushed me into the middle of a group of actors and said you need to find out how they became actors and I was mortified but I spoke to this one guy and he said he had been an estate agent for 25 years and then he decided I'm going to drama school. So he went to the Academy of Live and Recorded Arts and I never thought anything of it again. And then I re I'll never forget when I did my very first play in Dublin at the Gate Theatre, my Auntie Shelley, I get really emotional even thinking about it. She sent me a framed poster of that night that she wow. had kept all those years and you see because of my relationship with my family it was very difficult for them to believe that I was going to be able to be an actress so when I was auditioning for drama school like my parents lent me the money for three auditions because it was yeah. 35 quid each audition so I spent two of the audition fees on booze and then I had one fee left over for the Academy of Live and Recorded Arts and even after I did the audition it's nine thousand pounds a year to train you know so I told them, I remember going home to Fenor, they were on holiday and I told them I had auditioned and they said, well, you're not gonna get in. And even if you did, how are you gonna pay for it? And all the while Shelley is going, she's going to the Oscars, she's going. To. Just having one person on your side, it's so important when you're that young and that sort of, I felt so broken all the time, you know? and. Uh, and I'll never forget going down to the beach. And I remember I rolled a big joint. I was a big smoker and boozer. And I rang the school and to check on my audition because I hadn't heard anything. This is in the day before we didn't have, I didn't have a mobile, you know? And uh, so I had my dad's mobile and I, I rang and they said, we've been trying to get in touch with you. You have a place. And I said, okay that's great but I can't afford it and they said no no we're gonna pay for everything so they paid my fees my rent I got a full scholarship with money on top I'll never forget going back up to that house to my whole family and going hey, hey. <laughs> I got in it felt so good so so my feeling of um and also the thing that was also strange was I had been doing because I was working in pubs and I had finally, when I was 18, I was allowed to legally work and I was also allowed to legally sign on. So, so things had started, I started being able to kind of provide a little bit better for myself when I was 18, but most of it was going on booze. And, um, and I would go to an old nightclub called Imperial Gardens on a Saturday in the afternoon. It was closed down because it had loads of shootings there. And so this guy, this teacher took it over and did an improvisation class every Saturday. And no matter what was happening, I went to that improvisation class and he turned out to be a teacher at the Academy of Live and Recorded wow. Arts. So when I got in, it wasn't so much that I went there and found my tribe. It was that, because, you know, if I had gotten into somewhere like RADA mm -hmm. or one of the very fancy, fancy pants schools, yeah. 
I don't think my self-esteem would have been able for that. Like I needed to go to somewhere that was a little less known and where I was obviously, because I was wild, I was wild. When I got to Alra, I was wild and I wanted to set up a theater company. You know, I remember standing up at one of the, the meetings that you have, the meet and greets, and I said, I want to set up a theater company, who's in? Nobody came to me afterwards. And I thought, because I wanted to be an actor, not only because I loved being on stage, but I wanted to create a community for myself. You know, I didn't have that. So I was on my way to building that. And I knew I was really good at this one thing because otherwise, how the fuck does a girl go from being essentially, I was homeless at points when I got to London. Um, how, how did it start working out if I wasn't meant to be doing it, you know? And, um, and yeah, so, so I didn't really find my tribe in terms of the people at the school. Um, but what I was given was, I think the teachers knew I was good yeah. because I was there to be a great stage actress. That's what I wanted. And so it became really clear very soon. Like I was cast as Irina in Three Sisters in our second term, for example. And, and the term before that, I had been Alison in Look Back in Anger. And I felt those two parts were way too similar. I didn't want to play Irina. I wanted to play Natasha, who's a fantastic character in that play. And they said, well, you can't, it's been cast. So I went home and I shaved every bit of my hair off and I came in the next day and I said I want to play Natasha and they said okay you can play Natasha and from that moment it was like it was seen that oh she's really serious about this yeah and uh, yeah and then I met my agent in my third year and she's still my agent now she and you know when I met her I was this little bald crazed I told her I never want to do films and I never want to do TV. Don't ever put me up for that. I want to do theater for the rest of my life. And then within a year, I was like, I've got no money. <laughs> Can I do any TV? <laughs> and now I understand that it's good to do all of it, but I only ever wanted to be on stage. And, and really, even now, as much as I'm so delighted to get to experience all the other stuff, really, it's also that I can do whatever I want on stage. Yeah. It's because fast. I see that it's forever. Yeah, I mean, and you're extraordinary on stage. You're extraordinary in... in I am, I am. You, well, you are. <laughs> you don't have to agree, but you are. <laughs> but come here, and what's fascinating about your... what a scene of your work, and it's really interesting to hear you talk about it, is that you're such a precise actor in your wildness. It's really kind of... T it's fascinating. Because there's an edge of wildness there in, and I, and I mean it in the best possible way. And, yeah. and I think that's what makes you so in, interesting on screen as well, because you're kind of going, oh, something's going to happen here. Like, I mean, even like jumping right, kind of current, like, even with Paula, Jimmy, which was a very, very, very restrained part, you know, a very internal part, but you're kind of going, oh, oh, you know, you're watching I it. have no idea. On screen, I'm not there yet on screen for mm -hmm. me. I, I don't have as much i'm getting to understand oh you can be technical while also being really raw and all of yeah. that stuff you can do but but i would never have thought i was being like restrained in paula i i i just do the screen stuff and then go oh, hope, hope yeah, that no, it translates. Yeah. so so i'm glad that it's translating but yeah. but the greatest thing about the stage that i I mean that I love so much is because somebody said um, somebody said to me when I was in New York that her mentor who was Al Pacino had said to her after he came to see a show I did and he said to her you know she's not even there she's not even there she's gone and I said to her oh I can tell you I'm very much there like that's the joy of acting for me on stage is I don't disappear yeah. I don't forget where I am ever. If anything, I become so hyper aware of where I am. I could tell you everything that's going on in, in the room. If somebody is coughing up there, somebody's fallen down over there, somebody's fainted, there's something that needs to be fixed on the stage. That's that, what that's, I love. That's but, fascinating. But you, and, and kind of not to jump to kind of recently, but I mean, 
uh, wasn't that actually picked up in a few of the reviews of people, places, and things that you were actually hurt? There was that kind of you were so much the character that you weren't. Do you know what I mean? You were actually there was two things go go going on at once, which made it such an astonishing performance. I remember re reading that somewhere about about your relationship to that character um that it kind of it just the time of my life i mean i don't know i hope to do it again we're trying to figure out a way when the resurgence in new york happens of maybe doing it again um that was it was like being a conductor of the greatest orchestra i have like having everybody and that is what great writing does too, because Duncan is an incredibly kind writer to an audience. So I got to be in charge of everybody's like, they could trust me. Yeah. Um, I wasn't going to, because if I was out of control, then they wouldn't have been able to have the experience they had. But by knowing that I was working as hard as I could to keep everybody safe in that space, and my team, my community were doing everything to keep me safe. Like it was an extraordinary, and there wasn't a single performance that was like phoned in. I don't know if I'm able to phone stuff in anyway, maybe yeah. if I'm in some really shit, but, but everything, whatever night anyone saw it on, it was like that every night, I, you know, there was never, except maybe one night in New York when everyone was tired and I was fucking furious. because I was like, if you guys get tired, I have to do everything. <laughs> like you really understand the, the um, I started, uh, the designer said to me, you learned how to be a leader on that show. And I did. And the way to be a leader is to empower everybody on stage and, um, and to serve them so that they're able to serve you. It's an, I, I, I cannot even, even thinking about it makes me so happy that I got to do that. I, I, it was, it was great. Cause they're not all great. Some of them are really, really hard. And well, let, let, let's, talk, let's talk back a bit to kind of get back there. Um, because when you left, like, you know, the, you're sort of talking about, oh, like that kind of fear of leaving drama school and kind of go, oh Jesus, what next? But, but in the kind of 10 years, to ten or odd years between, say, drama school and um, and people, places, and things. You know, you worked across Ireland and the UK. You did an awful lot in T TV, but the, but the, also the, the kind of the role. It was kind of like you look at it now, and kind of you know, you the, the plays you were inhabiting in the spaces that you were in, in, inhabiting, whereas they weren't necessarily lead roles. There was kind of serious work. You know, you were kind of involved in in a lot of serious work ar around from very er early. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think that um, everything, every woman who visited me made room for the next woman. But the kind of the biggest woman was Emma in People, Places and Things. She just needed so much space. And because of all the women that had gone before her, I think particularly Abby in Desire Under the Elms, you know, there's nothing that gives you more space inside yourself than Eugene O'Neill or Tennessee Williams or Sean O'Casey, like Nora did a good job for me as well. Yeah. Um, they just burst through your, they, they, they crack you open in a way that means I, I can't really go back to, to playing smaller women now. Like I, re I remember a, a, a producer coming to me with a, a play and he was like, you know, this is great. It's a lead role. It's really, a, I was like, this is amazing. You're, thank you so much. And I went home and I read it and I was like, yeah, but she's me. She's, in, she's, in, there's nothing. I have too much space now. She's going to have to be like Harper coming after. Yeah. Angels in America coming after people, places and things. I mean, that was a whole different kind of space that I needed for her. Um, and uh, that was one of, I would probably say one of the worst experiences in terms of like emotionally and mentally and everything playing her and being in that space and doing that play, everything about it was just rough. And, uh, but also one of the greatest things I've ever yeah. been able to do. So my, the reason I'm saying it is that you, I don't expect every job even if it's a great piece of work that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to feel great and I, I remember uh, getting an award in New York for 
Broadway debut for Angels in America and the uh, and you were just told you could just say whatever, like that you had whatever m amount of time to accept your award. And when I went up there, yeah. I said, I said, uh, I really wish I was in SpongeBob SquarePants, the musical, because they all seem like they really love each other on that show. And uh, over at Angels in America, we all want to kill ourselves and each other. And I said, I said, this is an offering. I'm bringing you an offering at a time when that man was in the White House and at a time when we really needed to hear that story again, it's an offering, but I'm not having a great time doing it. And I remember the room just went complete, because in America, basically, you go up, you get an award and you just say, oh my God, it's amazing, this is amazing. But I believe in being really honest about what an experience is. You know, I do not regret doing it, but I would never wish to do that again, you know, like, um, but I'm so grateful for the experience. So grateful, but it was horrible. It's fascinating, though, like because that is very a very difficult road, and you, you, yeah, you do it instinctively. So it's not a road you've chosen to travel, but it comes across as, as honesty rather than affectation. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of not, a, you know. Oh, the, yeah, I can't be arsed with the affectation. But I think, it's like sorry, go on. sorry. Go on. No, go on. It, it's it's like false modesty, right? So. Yeah like false modesty runs in the same vein as arrogance i'm not i'm not interested in it i am not here to say oh my god i just i don't know like it's like i always talk about if i talk to young students especially young women in this industry i say if a plumber came to fix my toilet and came in and i saw the toilet and, was, and i said oh my god that is an amazing job thank you so much and if the plumber was to say um actually it's really bad like one that i fixed last week was way better or... <laughs> you'd think that was really weird but somehow as actors we've developed this affectation that's just like i don't know how it happens i don't i mean there's definitely for me a certain amount of i don't know how the fuck i do certain performances yeah. over and over and over i don't know i it's the universe so to me it's a spiritual experience but the idea that i'm not allowed to absolutely take pride in my work and say I'm really good at that is anathema to me. I'm not interested in playing coy with something that has taken such an, an, an amount of effort to get good at, you know, because you can have when you start out and when you're in your raw, like embryonic actor stage, it's wild. And then you need to hone it, you know, you hone it, you hone it, you hone it. Like a carpenter, a great woodworker or whatever, you get better and better, a painter, whatever. Um, so I have, in my mind, I have the right now. Uh, and I think the responsibility to say, yeah, I, I, I did really well at that. That was really good. Like I was super aware at every moment with people, places and things that I was I was conducting and and I was able for it you know there's no point in in being demure about that yeah with angels in America it was harder because it was a it was a trickier part there's yeah. things about Harper that are I knew I was doing something a bit more I guess new with her in that for me I was playing a woman in an abusive relationship she was there was gaslighting there was um abuse yeah. and so and so my Harper, it was like she came to me and said, tell them how fucking angry I am. So she was, yeah, she was really angry. And I think um, people can find that quite difficult, but um, I've sort of forgotten my point. My point, I guess, is just, I, I yeah, I, I have practiced enough to be able to say, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm good at doing that. But I think that I think as well, there's kind of, you know, um, having, you know, people say about, you know, having the balls or whatever to kind of stand up and say certain the ovaries. Yeah, sorry, the old, pardon me, you're absolutely correct. <laughs> I speak, Why would I want balls? They're I so speak, sensitive. I speak from my own place, sorry. <laughs> no, but sorry. Yeah, oh, but, but you're right, but in, in relation to the space I'm um, talking about gender, I mean, you've been very vocal about it in the last few years particularly and have used platforms that you've been given to speak about things like you know equality of pay and but I think again it comes from a place of and I don't mean stage character but character your character you you know rather than 
I'm going to be a mouthpiece now for this. It's kind of like, well, I, I'm actually, this is what I believe. Yeah, I, I spoke to somebody about that earlier, actually. It's, I was doing it long before it was like a hashtag. Yeah. Same with the Black Lives Matter movement. I have seen huge problems in our industry, particularly for black women and women of color. I have, before um, people have started kind of vocalizing it the way they are now, I have, I don't have a choice in how, if I see something being <coughs> unfair or people misrepresented, underrepresented or not represented at all, then I have to speak about it. And I've been doing that sometimes to my own detriment, but always to the, it's always felt better afterwards. You know, I have lost jobs. I have walked away from things. I've had massive fights with very powerful people. But I look back and think I'm really glad I did that. You know, I, I don't believe in, I don't want to be like famous enough for me to sacrifice my integrity about things, you know. And I also don't want to get to the top unless everyone has the opportunity to get to the top. Like it shouldn't just be a, a specific look or a specific type. Yeah. I think and I think that that comes across in, playing the women that I play too like getting cast as sometimes as women that could be played quite demurely or quite um apologetically I try to find a way to give the women I play a voice that they would probably want for themselves but that over years have been maybe directed to be a little bit sweeter or yeah. easier there's yeah. a lot of you know I was always told I was too much you know and and, and it's weird because you have this this thing that is like, I'm told I'm too much and yet I feel not enough sometimes. So how do you reconcile that? You're constantly trying to reconcile that thing. And it's about saying, I, I have to now in my forties, I have to be able to just speak my truth and stand up for what I believe in. And especially now that I'm, I'm starting to get power in the industry. So, so I can choose to either go the way of what happens for some people which is you get to a certain point and you just go oh great i'm here mustn't rock the boat or you get to that point and you lift the fence up and you say come on everybody in <laughs> everybody as many people in as possible yeah. and i think that can cause issues just for there can be times when i think it's difficult for people because they think well come on you're in the gang now so yeah stop with this stuff that you're going on with and i think i'm only getting started well, i think I, I think i've met a kindred spirit um i think it's, it's funny because we i mean access kind of exists obviously in ballymun which would have a name all over years of like social deprivation and you know yep. but it's, it's fascinating like watching some of the parts you've played but also from kind of working here like we used to get it enough like, oh isn't it great that there's an art center in ballymun you're kind of going what's that mean you know, or it's the great opportunity for working class writers. You're kind of going, what? I mean, but you only have to look at the way that the cuts happen in terms of like the 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 upper echelons, the private schools and everything over here, they totally understand the power of the arts. So mm -hmm. they pour money into it. And then as a result, you have all these people coming out of those types of schools able for the world that they're now in yeah. and we are like working class lower class considered yeah. lower class people that's the first thing they take away is their access to the arts when yeah. actually the yeah. arts create especially for people who come from um any kind of trauma any kind of neglect any kind of difficulty the arts can save lives because they give a sense of community when you don't have community. I mean, the arts saved my life. There is no doubt about it. I would be dead now mm -hmm. if I didn't have, like if those people didn't give me yeah. the money to go to drama school and do that. If my agent hadn't seen me and said, I'm going to take care of that young woman. Because if you don't come from something that offers that as, a, as an option, yeah. you begin to think... Yeah. There's no place for you in it. It's like representation, you know. If if, if there's a brilliant quote, uh, James Baldwin says that, uh, or said that, when a child puts his eyes in the world, he must use what he sees. So if the children are only seeing a certain type of person, yeah. 
become successful and the, like any black young black person young black child in america if all they're seeing and here uh, everywhere all they're seeing is their depictions in movies and everything is drug dealers or uh, being killed all of that's that's what they have to use and that's not fair that's yeah. not fair and award ceremonies the same thing if all you're seeing i when i got my olivier award um there was only white actresses in the category and I thought I cannot fucking believe that in London in London's theatre in a year where a lot of women amazing as every year a lot of women of colour and black women had done fantastic performances weren't even they weren't recognised and so I made a speech when I accepted my award and I remember sitting with Angie my sister who you know yeah. and all night the the um the host of the show kept saying the diversity of London theatre and here we are. And I turned to Angie and I was getting nervous because I thought, fuck, if I win, I have to make this speech. Um, and I said to her, am I right? Like, am I imagining this? Am I imagining? Like, it, and I realised how the gaslighting. So if imagine being a, a, a black woman or a black person, a person of color in that audience and hearing that you're being represented and going, no, I'm fucking not being represented. But for me that night, after I made my speech and I went off stage and I was being interviewed, I imagined what was going to happen was it was going to become the focus of the interviews that in the press the next day, we would be talking about the fact that the Olivier Awards had uh, not represented a whole entire um, amount of uh, women. And one journalist asked me, why did you say that? One journalist, I couldn't believe it. And, and I said, well, these are the things kids watch. I grew up, I was allowed to stay up and watch the Oscars. Yeah. You know, I saw myself reflected all the time. Yeah. White women, blonde hair, blue eyes. I was everywhere. So yeah. even though in the socioeconomic thing and, you know, from the West of Ireland, I wasn't yeah. necessarily seeing that, but, but I was seeing a version of myself. I said, we have a responsibility, don't we, to, yeah. to be showing young people what's available to them. And I just couldn't believe that it wasn't a hook that night at all. It, it just turned into, that was a bit... <laughs> That's a bit funny that you did that. It's kind of a funny thing to do. We ignore that now and move on. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I couldn't get my head around it. And the thing that really bothered me, Mark, was that all of those women who had been on stage doing brilliant performances were all invited to work at the ceremony. They were invited to sing. They were invited to present awards. All of that. And I was like, this just feels so wrong to me. And so... Yeah, so I guess uh, unless we all, unless we're all being given the opportunities, then what's the point? Like, I think you're right. I think there's something right. I mean, I completely agree with you, and I, but I also do completely agree with you that speaking openly and without anger and without blame at the reality that we have to live in can sometimes be seen as a threat, which, which again, that's the bit that I don't un understand, that we kind of all want a more inclusive space, then what's the problem with talk? I mean, I, for, for example, we banned the, the use of the word outreach here, because I kind of go, I don't know, I, I mean, it's about kind of bringing people in. I've no, I've no, my joke is I have no idea of what I'm doing. So you kind of go, I need everyone to come and help me do what I do, because I have no idea, you know, whatever. But it's a calling, right? It's call, yeah, no, but also it's kind of that sense of, you know, leadership, what you mentioned about leadership, is about kind of, well, I, I view leadership as facilitation. It's kind of like, well, yeah, yes. well, I, I don't, actually don't want that responsibility. Thank you very much. I'm kind of going, come on in, and I'd much rather use you doing it, because then you can do all the work. So I'm joking. But, yeah, but, but I think, yes, I think you're, you're onto something about you, what you understand fundamentally is, is it's almost your job is to empower people to mm. do the things themselves it's we're not doing anybody a favor here but, but, like but also, but also doubly and i think what's more important now um in the age of you know, immediacy and people who've risen to power in, in america and the uk and lots of, of other places is that just kind of it can develop you know right and left or black and white or whatever very quickly and there's no there's no room for like I would, I love surrounding myself with people that I don't agree with and don't agree with me about certain things. So it's not about this kind of consensus bit. But if you have a belief in 
point A, then you have to agree with all these points. Because I think yeah. life's not like that, you know. Yeah. Sorry, I, I digress slightly in a way, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested yeah. in, in what, in say, just that level of, and I'm kind of getting back to the, a lot of the characters that you've played, and you mentioned anger, and you mentioned kind of, you know, them inhabiting you and kind of you know, creating space for them. But it's also that sense of, and I think what struck me as being so powerful about, say, Angels in America and People, Place and Things, and kind of, I mean, I saw your Nora, Nora Clitheroe years ago in, in The Plow and the Stars and, and The Birds, which you did in the game. But I think it's also that sense of, of empathy is the wrong word, but that that's a word so that these people are real people. So it's yeah. not about, it's not about, and I, you know, I remember you getting applauded at the time for people, places and things that you're kind of going, the strangeness of playing an addict as a real person. You're kind of going. <laughs> yeah, but also the idea that like, that I didn't ask for sympathy. You know, yeah. that was a big thing to people. She doesn't ask for sympathy. And I was like, because women don't. Mm. Not every woman does. Like, why are we still, uh, the, the biggest thing I find that people get problematic, I remember a director saying to me once when I played a part, and I'll never forget it, I wanted to kill him. He said, well, I don't understand why anyone would want to fuck her if you play her like that. And I thought, oh, you don't want anything except yeah. a version of what you find fuckable as opposed to a woman who I have um, fleshed out into being the kind of woman that I know. I mean, the women in my life, we do all sorts of different, and women can be assholes too. Like, why do we kind of this idea, you know, I found it specifically with Harper. I remember uh, an, another person saying to me, she should be a bit more cartoonish maybe. And I thought, Okay, so it's a woman who has locked herself in her house because she knows she's going against her in intuition, which is telling her that her husband is gay. Her husband is telling her she's not pretty when she's angry and knows that she has an addiction, but blames the addiction on her rather than on taking any responsibility for himself. Gaslights her entirely. Mm -hmm. So it was really important to me that my Harper won at the end. And I don't mean won a competition between yeah, her and other yeah, people yeah. that she meets. She won her life. She realized, actually, the power is totally in me. I need to get the fuck away from this guy who doesn't know what he's doing and get out. But what you find when you're creating characters like this is you come up against a lot of people who don't really want you to do that. Yeah. As a girl. You yeah. know, it's like, but she's really cute. Don't... Why you? I read, I read um, Tina Fey's brilliant book, Bossy Pants, which I love and I, I read it kind of often. And um, she talks about Amy Poehler showing up at Saturday Night Live. And she said, oh, it was like I suddenly was like, oh, my friend is here. My friend is here. And she said she really fell in love with Amy Poehler when one night she was making a, a really crass joke. And Jimmy Kimmel turned around to her and said, oh, don't do that. I don't like it when you do that. Uh, gross I don't like it when you do that and Amy Poehler turned around and said I don't give a fuck what you like and I thought Tina Fey said it was like for the first time she was like I'm not here for this to be palatable for you we have to get out of the idea that automatically especially in these big great plays that were written like even the Sean O'Casey you know with Nora Usually she can be a bit kind of wafty and just following Jack around. But to me, my Nora, the one that came to me was a woman who had married beneath her station. Like she was a posh girl who fell in love with this amazing guy and she started and she married him, but she thought that they'd be getting out of there. And then they didn't. And I remember somebody, one of the reviewers saying, oh, she was far too posh or something. And she said something about my accent. And, and I thought, Fuck you, man. I made the decision to do that. Those are actually clear decisions that I'm making to try and make a character that can exist one way, trying to make her a little bit more active because it's so it's just it became so much part of our our kind of history as women in in every part of this industry to kind of fall back on being sort of 
waiting to be saved, you know, but not uh, uh, most of these women, if you scratch the surface, they're, they're not, you can make them really, really active in a, and you know, with Harper, she went to town on me. She was just so furious all the time. <laughs> I remember thinking, oh my God. And then, and another woman, a female said to me once, you might want to just think about softening her up. And I was like, do you think I wouldn't fucking do that if I could do that? That's not what's coming to me. Yeah. So piss off, making her more sweet, making her, if they don't come to me sweet, then I'm not going to try and force them to be sweet, you know? Yeah. That's fascinating. But even, even that, that, you know, the way you speak about them is really interesting. And I'm kind of interested in that, in that process for you, Denise, about kind of, you know, when you're either developing a character in you or, you know, taking on, uh, you know, one of the, archetypes or you know one of the canon you know that yeah. sense of something coming to you like what's that like you know is there a, like how is, is it different for every play in relation to like where's the start for you you know the relationship to the text or what you know how does that work normally for you i think it, it that whole thing started with an audition process actually i i i, I knew really early on i didn't want to be in this kind of competitive thing with other women like it was too much the compare despair thing that i'd get into was really um toxic for me and so when I was starting out I was auditioning for something at the National Theatre and I auditioned over and over it was for the night season and they had already cast Susan Lynch and Justine Mitchell both of whom I loved and I was to I was auditioning for the younger sister and I didn't get it and I was fucking devastated and then I thought okay I have to as a way to sort of process this I want to go and see the woman who got it. I want to go and be part of yeah. celebrating a woman on stage because there is a woman on stage. Mm. Uh, and I went and it was Sarah Jane Drummy, I think her name was. And she looked exactly like Justine Mitchell and Susan Lynch. So they looked like sisters and it was so beautiful. And I thought, I would have been so wrong. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, I had this sort of experience within myself that was like, oh, if I imagine it, she's in the room at the audition, whatever the woman is, and she's going, you are amazing. You are so brilliant, but your body is just not the right body for me. Like your hand doesn't quite fit my hand. So I need to go to Sarah because Sarah's body is perfect, but it doesn't mean you're any less of an actress or any less of a person it's just I need somebody else and so I kept up with that sort of thinking and I remember auditioning for A Doll's House at the Young Vic and I wanted it so badly and I read every fucking a, a translation of it and yada 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 and I did the audition and I was like please please forcing it forcing it thinking you know because you can have classes these days about just manifest that shit you know and sometimes that you're not manifesting you're not meant to be manifesting that anyway I didn't get it Hattie Morahan got it and so again I went to see Hattie in the play and it was incredible and I would have been completely wrong in that production like completely my whole body my whole energy everything would have been wrong for this beautiful production same thing with a uh, streetcar named Desire. Vanessa Kirby got Stella and I really wanted Stella. Went to see it and thought, she's perfect. Her body was exactly, her energy was exactly what was needed. So, so to me, they find the women they're meant to find, you know? So, so when people, places and things, for example, happened, I... I kind of was at a stage where I had I had taught, you know, Michael Murphy, that fantastic, beautiful Michael Murphy. So he's a dear friend of mine, although I haven't seen him in ages. But um, he gave me a great gift, which was he taught me how to teach a class and he did it over Skype. And uh, and I then out of the blue was asked to teach a class and I went into a university. I had no money. I was fucked. I hadn't worked in nearly like 12, 13 months went into this university, can't even remember where it is, and taught these kids. And 
I left and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to be a really good teacher. I loved that. I felt so good about it. I felt like, oh, this is like, I had to grieve the fact that I thought my acting career was over, but I was like, I did pretty well though. Mm -hmm. Like I had worked with some great people. I had worked on stage so much. And then I got the audition for People, Places and Things, but I had gotten myself to a point where I was like, okay, if this one doesn't go my way, I'm out like and it's fine because I'm meant to be out because it's not supposed to happen if I don't get this one you know it was too perfect for me <laughs> and uh, and I'll never forget like in the audition it was I was so free because I was like this is sayonara if it doesn't happen but I'm not asking you I knew I'm not going into this room begging for this part uh, um, because she will t she will tell them yeah whether it's me or not and of course she went, yeah, that'll do. That's the body for me. Anyone who snorts a gram of icing sugar in an audition. But I'll tell you a story about that part though, because everybody thinks Duncan wrote that part for me and he didn't, I didn't know Duncan before it, but I, it was my 40th recently and I had like a gratitude party for my friends at um, a restaurant here. And it was the last restaurant I had worked at as a waitress 13 years ago. And so Duncan was there and halfway through the meal, I was kind of working my way around the table and, uh, and I got to his seat and he said, I'm going to tell you something. And I was like, yeah, what? And he said, the last time I was here, Denise, was 13 years ago and you were my waitress. And I had seen you on stage a few weeks previous to that. And I couldn't understand why you were my waitress because I had thought you were so brilliant in the play. And my mother was horrible to you. So I left you a big tip and... And so when people ask me, did I write this play for you? I guess I kind of did wow. because that whole speech and the speech that he wrote about acting when I auditioned, Jeremy got me to do that speech and I couldn't stop crying. And Jeremy was like, yeah, maybe she's not so emotional. And I said, I've never been allowed. Nobody has ever written what it's like. So it's going to take me a few times of crying through it. And then if you give me the part and we work together, we'll get to a point where I'm not crying all the way through it. But excuse me very much. This is profound for me. And it turned out that somewhere in his mind, she was going, it's the girl from that restaurant. It's her. That's and so, incredible. yeah, so now I just... Like, uh, uh, listen, I, I look at other women sometimes, their work, and I'm like, oh my God, they're amazing. And it can look, you know, on days where I'm premenstrual or I'm like, haven't eaten properly or I haven't slept properly. I'm more prone to thinking, oh my God, everyone's better than me. Just like everybody else. It's why Instagram is like a fucking minefield of, you know, don't go on there when you're feeling bad because you'll end up at somebody's like beautiful wedding on a beach with people yeah. you don't know going everyone's way more beautiful than me um but so now i i can really see how everyone gets the one they're supposed to get yeah and and so i don't need to worry about it so so the women will find me and and when i didn't get that doll's house i got Abby in Desire Under the Elms and I didn't even know who the fuck she was it was like she crawled out from under a rock or out of the bushes and went you I need you and like scratching herself and it, it was like oh yeah I was supposed to play her it's weird then the flip side of that like okay that's the way you kind of they inhabit but then is that a difficult process to divest then afterwards like is it do they leave as easy as they enter um Sometimes I find with TV, actually, they hang around a bit more. Um, but I do this process called derobing. You have to derobe. I worked that out with a very brilliant therapist who was like, you have to do something. And also, actually, Mark Rylance, another weird moment in my life was doing people, places and things. I had 11 weeks to go on the West End run and I had my head on the dressing table and Jacob from the play was in the doorway and I was like, I don't know how this is gonna happen, I'm fucked. How am I gonna do 11 more weeks? And I said to him, you know what I'm gonna do? 
I'm going to ring my agent and see if Mark Rylance will come and have a cup of tea with me because everybody talked about Jerusalem at the same time. So there was a big thing about, I, I didn't see Jerusalem, but there was this whole thing about, of course, I can't just be Denise Goff doing a play. I'm like the new Mark Rylance doing a play. You know, the, the, Mark Rylance isn't the new anybody. Women are always the new somebody. Um, anyway, if it's not a bad one to be compared to, I was fine with it. But, but anyway, I said, I'm going to get my agent to call and see if he'll meet me for a tea because I had, I had spoken to Imelda Staunton, the great Queen Imelda, and uh, she was really kind. She was doing gypsy and she was saying to me, okay, it's just about being an athlete, you know, and just so fantastic. Anyway, um, I was like, I'm going to do that thing that actors get to do when they are kind of shiny. And no joke, Mark, five minutes later, the company manager comes to the dressing room and said, Mark Rylance is in the audience and he'd like to come up afterwards. Would you be all right with that? <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Talk yeah. about getting what you need, you know? So he and his I wife. I didn't, need, I didn't need him to be here. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, who else can I make come? Who's, yeah. who's next, who's next? Um, but yeah, so he came up that night with his fantastic wife, Claire, and they, and uh, I said, how do you, do you sleep? <laughs> how, I can't sleep. And he, and they, they do a lot of like energy work and everything, totally woo woo, which I love. And she said, you know, in the curtain call, you're vibrating because, oh, everybody's energy is coming in at you. And um, so you've got to take it off. You've got to let, leave it on the stage, you know, develop something. He yeah. does a kind of dancing, shaking. And, and so the next night I developed, like I took her off like a dress and thanked her and sent her off. And uh, even just doing something like that mm -hmm. meant that I started sleeping better. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I derobed, but sometimes I forget to, like I just finished a TV job, which was really fucking intense. And, uh, for a couple of weeks afterwards, I was really moody and eating really badly and just feeling really shit. And then this woman said to me, you know, you've just finished something like when the child or the thing that the core of you finishes something, they're sort of grieving. Yeah. So you need to give some time and like lots of gentleness, being really kind, writing a lot, like how you're feeling, everything. And then they and then they go and usually they go like with people, places and things. She's still hanging around somewhere because she's going, we're going back. on. Yeah, yeah. I'm just letting you know that. So and I'm happy for her to be somewhere because she gives me great energy. But but Harper, I was like, OK, yeah. off to San Francisco now. Thank you, sister. I'm really happy you were here, but I really don't want to see you for a really long time. Well, that's amazing. I mean, you, you speak about it and it's, it's just been talking to you and critical the arts and, you know, right now as we're speaking at Christmas COVID time and um, but also because anything you've spoken about there is applicable to people's normal life in relation to exactly. moving on from things and I think that was part of the reason why and that's why it's so perfect to talk to you because that was part of the reason why I started this series was to kind of a that actors are real people too but also that the process of acting is the process of change and moving on from exactly. from anything in life you know, any, any trauma, or and it's basically, I find that's not spoken about enough in relation to, in relation to actors in a way being sounding boards or being kind of great, so, but I'm less than heroic, but being, being great kind of journey people on the, on those roads because you go to that. Well, because I think, I think for some though, what happens is there's an arrested development that can happen. So when an actor, especially when they're very young and they become very successful for doing something that came very naturally to them and then they get huge success and suddenly they're in the industry and everybody's on them. Their actual spiritual sort of thing that they had, it gets frozen because it becomes about something else. Yeah. But you see, when, when you've been doing it, I've been doing it a long time and the big shiny success thing didn't come till I was 35. By that point, I had had years of therapy, mm -hmm. years of self-reflection, years of self-examination and an understanding that if I don't continue to do that as I age, then how can I keep playing women who are aging? You know, you've got to, I've got to, uh, keep discovering new facets and everything of myself. Otherwise, 
you get a bit stale, you know? So for me, the kind of process of letting go, I suppose it's like being in a relationship. If you move on too quickly into something else, you take the stuff from the other relationship into it. So, so by developing a process of, of derobing and letting go, then I'm clean when I go into the next one, but I have the space that the, the, the previous person left for the next person to fit. Do you know, do you know what I mean? I, I, I know absolutely know what you mean, but it's also the fact of, of the fact that, you know, I think for the public looking into the arts and looking, particularly people they say might see on TV or on stage or people who acquire a level of kind of fame in whatever, whatever way, is that they become less real people to them or they only, or you, mentioned, yeah. you mentioned Instagram or, you know, magazines are the only real interface. So that becomes a surprise when you hear people talking about, you know, breaking their finger or breaking up with someone or break, whatever the hell it is. Yeah. And that to me was a driver behind doing this as well. The fact that actually know it's, there's not, I love your ana analogy about like, you know, opening the gate and kind of come on in. It's kind of also letting the public come on. We use, sorry, we, we use the sports analogy here an awful lot that like yeah, a young boy or girl who's out playing soccer out on the field or the back garden, they're playing the same sport as an elite professional. Um, but no one's saying they're as good as, but I think a lot of time in the arts that it's viewed as, well, you know, they're not having the same, pro they, they are having the same process. They're having the same dreams. They're having the same imagination. Yeah. Sometimes in the arts, it's kind of seen that they're, if you say that, it somehow damages the elite athlete. You know, it damages. Yeah, I kind know. Of, but I think actors, actors are guilty of, of, of perpetuating that too, though. You know, that idea that we, um, well, maybe it's not actors, but the industry certainly protects certain actors from having to, kind of deal with the idea that they're human mm. you know and the expectation I see it with people who do massive massive movies you know that suddenly the expectation is to feed their fans a certain amount and to be a certain way and and you see them split their personality into yeah. not knowing like the idea for me of being so famous that you can't walk down the street is and I could not deal with that like the idea that I, I get very, um, it's not really uncomfortable. It's just, I want to skewer the idolatry that goes on uh, within the industry because I don't think it's helpful for anybody. Like we now live in that kind of um, sanitized, very clean, dressed up, ver we put out versions of ourselves. And I don't know, I just think in the age where we really need to be speaking a lot about mental health and everything, it's really important that people who, um, are in positions uh, where they have a certain platform to to be careful of how they use that platform. You know, I see an addiction to kind of the platform being used to give give me love. You know, I'll put a picture of myself looking beautiful, and 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 we'll all get a little hit out of that. Mm. But actually. I don't know, it's like sugar that wears off and, and then you feel a bit rough afterwards. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, I there are days when I think, yeah, having about a million people say I look beautiful and gorgeous. I used to, when I was on Facebook many, many moons ago, I before I was anyone in the industry, you know, just a person on Facebook, I would put pictures of myself looking beautiful with a crop, with underneath saying, tell me how beautiful I am because I'm having a shit day. Yeah. So I was really clear about what I was asking I for. But, <laughs> yeah, but I think that there's something about, um, it's very addictive that, you know, and, and uh, me like everybody else, I can, f you know, I would fall in, but, I, but I'm really trying not to, to, to do that with the platform that I have now. I'm, I'm just trying to, as much as possible i don't want to lecture people but i certainly don't want to be part of um having to play a part in my real life yeah like this is my real life you're yeah. in my living room yeah i'm not gonna act with you for however long we're gonna talk to each other because it's fucking exhausting Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do know how to keep certain things yes. specifically if I'm speaking to a, a journalist or uh, it's going out into yeah. a paper. I know how things can get twisted. So I'm a little more careful of, 
you know, I, I became very known at the beginning for being really sweary and it became like, you know, she's so down to earth and sweary. And I thought, Oof, I don't, as soon as you try to pigeonhole or do or yeah. live up to a certain thing that people want from you, yeah. I'm not being true to myself. And I just, I haven't got the energy yeah. anymore to, especially now, I think the pandemic has taught me specifically like to be like authenticity is everything a young actress I worked with once said to me what's your biggest fear and I said being inauthentic and she went oh and I said why what's yours and she said spiders <laughs> and I was like oh sorry I'm a bit <laughs> I get a bit on about things like that <laughs> Commissioner, I, I won't keep you much longer, but I'm, I'm interested. We haven't spoken much about the other side of your career in relation to the kind of screen, uh, both big and small. And um, I'm particularly saying the last few years, you know, the range of work you've been involved in has been brilliant. I mean, talk about kind of going from, you know, fantasy land in The Kid Who Would Be King to Paula to like mm -hmm. one of my, I, I, I love Juliet Naked, for example. It's a great movie. And also, and also Colette. You know what I mean? So there's kind of, that's. Yeah, that's yeah, movie. yeah. Of things. Yeah, but I mean, it's all, it all comes. That's all, every single one of those were people asking me to do something. You know, I didn't, that's the kind of beauty as well. Of once you cross over the line and suddenly everybody goes, oh my God, she can really do it. Best newcomer, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, suddenly you get letters from directors, very lovely letters asking you to do stuff. And you think, fucking hell, man, this is how the other half have been living, you know, because yeah. I was, I've auditioned my whole life. I, I, I mean, I still audition for things, but a, a lot of stuff now happens because somebody, I mean, that play completely transformed my life. I mean, I'm about to do, I'm doing this Star Wars prequel TV show. <laughs> I have to break it up because I'm, I don't, I don't really know when I met uh, Tony to talk about it I was like I don't this isn't my thing like I don't really know what this is and he was like yeah I know it's great it's great that you don't and I thought that all happened because he saw me in a play so so for me again everything that happened with with my big moment of success what makes it so beautiful for me is that it's so old-fashioned because nobody gets fucking famous from doing a play yeah it's cool Get me. Yeah. <laughs> so i'm proving i'm trying to prove a point you know yeah. if you just do the work well i think i mean as i mentioned to you at the beginning of, of our chat with the you know there is an energy that you inhabit on set. i mean like you know you, the relationship with yourself and Karen knightley kind of you know glowed off the screen there's Paula, as I said, was kind of a very different vibe, but the, there is, like, do you watch yourself? Have you, have, have, have you seen Everything, it? except oh, Juliet yeah. Naked, actually. I didn't watch Juliet Naked because about midway through one of the scenes, I was like, oh, I'm a girlfriend part. <laughs> okay. I was literally standing in a kitchen with Chris O'Dowd going, I'm only here because I'm his girlfriend in it. Hmm. And that was the last time. It was my first time and last time playing a girlfriend. Um, yeah. But it was a nice experience. I've just never, I've never watched it. Yeah. But, but everything, oh my God, my whole career, I've watched everything. I read wow. every review. I fucking love it. I love doing that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's all part of the game. It's not, wow. I don't see it as, it's like I got a review when I was really young. I got a review saying, Denise Goff gives the most irritating, look at me, I'm not listening to any one performance I've ever seen on a West End stage. And I thought that was just brilliant because I was playing Phoebe in As You Like It. So that's exactly what she's meant to do. And I was like, I just love that a bad review is actually a good review. of. Yeah. So I don't get involved in... Um, in my esteem being smashed because of like, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care about that stuff. You don't need to tell me I'm good or bad or it, it doesn't, it's just not what it's about. So I, I've been known to have, I have quite funny relationships with a lot of critics and one in particular, Susanna Clapp, who I just love, you know, I just love her. She's so great. And she, um, takes to, I sometimes when people like in the New Yorker Hilton Owls wrote basically wrote an essay about me in the New Yorker and I was like oh come on man that's like fucking legend stuff Jesus so 
what's the point in making it that uh, and and with regard to watching myself it's so important i had a director once a female director i said can i see that what i just a take i had just done and she said oh i don't like beautiful actresses watching themselves on screen and i thought don't you fucking patronize me i'm gonna watch and see what i've just done firstly because i didn't really trust what she was doing but I will when I really trust a director and I don't and I feel like no no they've got it I'm I'm yeah. fine with that but every now and then if I want to see because I can go like I'm Paula I would get so excited I go up watch the thing and I go just give me one more and I'll just do this one thing at that point and that will be because it's um I I don't I I don't subscribe for myself to I mean, watching myself getting older is an interesting experience. Watching myself on screen, it's interesting because you're like, oh, I have to do another thing where I go, oh, it's okay. And this thing I just did for ITV, I mean, I look destroyed in it. Like yesterday, I was comparing myself to some beautiful woman on Instagram. And then my agent called today and said, will you have a look at these photographs of the ITV drama? And I was like, oh, shit. And I had to look at like 500 pictures of myself looking so hideous. And yet, if I can get out of an ego of it and go, yeah. oh, oh, that looks really great. She looks. So I, I, I talk about it when I'm watching myself. I say, oh, she's doing this. She's going to do this. Okay. So I have a separation. Yeah. But like when I did People, Place and Things, me and Angie sat in a cafe around the corner and we read every review oh, and i was like this going listen to yeah, this one i mean if, if, if you're going to read reviews they're the ones to be reading they were the ones absolutely <laughs> but yeah i watch everything and i i keep an eye on everything and i i love all that okay. it's all part of the kind of joy of because it doesn't really matter yeah no, but, yeah, like, sorry, but that 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 yeah it, but it, do, it does matter in other ways but, but the fact that it doesn't matter is a huge boon to where, where you are, you know, in your life as a person and an act. You know, I have to kind of, just before, before we go, Denise, I've got kind of... Oh, sorry, one thing, though, that I can't do is watch myself on stage filmed. Oh, yeah. Never the twain should meet. Never film, never. Like, I caught a tiny bit of Angels in America, the NT Live, and I was like, oh, oh, no, no, I'm terrible. I'm a terrible actress. And yet, because and yet... They should yeah, but on, and yet you were astounding in Dear Ireland in the the, the piece you did for, for, with the Abbey recently. Um, yeah, but that was a film. I made a film. It's yeah. different. I watched, and she, that character, she came to me twice. So once I filmed it, and then I did it again. And then I said to Sarah, I was like, do you want me to do it again? No, because initially I was doing it like, I was doing Standing by the Window, just reading yeah. it. And then, oh, I had a funny story about this, though. I, I didn't know the writer, Sarah, right? And I was in this creative women's group during lockdown. And I had been saying in that group, I was like, I was like you know, we're all coming out of isolation in isolation. And I was really proud of that. I mean, that sounds really good, doesn't it? And then I get sent this script, right? And in the script, the character says, I'm coming out of isolation in isolation. I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, nothing I say is original. Why is it not original? So then I FaceTimed the writer and she answers and she's in the women's group that I was in, the creative women's group. And she said, I'm so sorry. I was, I heard you say it, but you didn't know, I didn't know if you were going to do it or not. And then I was listening to something you were saying. It was so brilliant. So she's now a dear, dear friend of mine. And we, we did the, I, I went into the bathroom and decided, my friends, Joe and Christine, the desperate optimists, they're filmmakers from Dublin yeah. and they live downstairs. And uh, I said, what could I do? I could just, I gotta put it on a tripod. And then I threw soy sauce everywhere and I was in my pajamas. And then the shower started dripping and everything. It was, all this magic was happening. And I was like, this is fucking great. And then I did it twice, tried to do it again, and it was gone. She was just gone. I was like, oh, she's busy. She's working on the NHS front line. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of scared of you now after, after talking to you in a very good way. <laughs> oh, I'm a witch. I am a witch. Before I let you go, we have, I, I was in college um, with Conor McPherson years ago. It was in this kind of first, I know. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, kind of, we did, I was, 
I'll never forget one of his first full end plays. He kind of came in to, to Dramsock with the, I think it's still have the script at home somewhere, but it like with his photocopied handwritten script. And he was so excited, just so excited that kind of, I don't oh, know. What do you do? No, get in here now. And that's never left him. Do you know what I mean? That sense of, um, but I think, I mean, obviously you were in, in, in the birds and obviously Paula, but I think just there's, I was amazed at, I think his trajectory and just in relation to him being an, an artist and him being from Ireland and him not, be, you know, a lot of his work kind of being outside the country. But I remember one of those, it's kind of a long way to get to a question for you, but I remember one of those moments about three years ago, I went over to the London to see um, Girl from the North Country because I was intrigued. I was kind of going, Connor, what the, heck? you know? And I was kind of going, oh my God, <laughs> you know? So beautiful. Yeah, but so kind of a step away or a step into it, you know, a whole other, I mean, we used to slag him in college about, you know, his characters would never talk to each other, you know, or his characters would just talk to the audience. And then he went in the weird going, look, look, they don't really talk to each other in the weird. <laughs> you know, they don't. But I suppose that relationship you have with him, I mean, I think the Paula was so, theatrical is the wrong word, but it was so, such a living thing. Her character was such yeah. a living thing. And that's what I kind of really like about watching you on screen. It's that kind of, it's, it's non-complete. And I mean it in the best way possible. I don't mean that the characters aren't complete, but it's... I think that he said something like that about me. He said some, something about, he was like, I don't know, you're weird or something, something weird about you. And I was like, oh, that's such a lovely thing for you to say. <laughs> you know, I went to see, I went to see Girl from the North Country with Connor. And I was sat there going, this is so beautiful. And I was crying. He's going, come meet the actors in the interval. I was like, Connor, we can't go backstage in the interval. He said, of course we can, come on, come on. Brings me up around onto the stage, up to all the dressing rooms. I was, I love him because he, he does it his own way completely. Yeah. And he, he doesn't have, I remember getting a note off him once in the birds. Oh God, I was such a baby. And I was so in awe of like working with Kieran and Nade I don't know, and, and, and I couldn't make a certain thing work. And, I said, Connor, I don't, I don't know. Like, how do I make that move work? And he went, well, you could learn the lines for one thing. And I was like, oh my God. He's like straight down the line. Well, There's like no frills and yet his work speaks for itself. Yeah. So if ever there was somebody who's completely himself and does brilliant work, there he is, you know? Yeah, so well, that's what I, I think. It's got a two year great match, but it's funny as well that I haven't seen Connor, you know, So we bet there was a blip there, and I my, my it was brilliant. It was a brilliant blip. Uh, myself, I had a moment of brilliant, you know, innovation <laughs> thinking with Denise Goff with the sound. We went. broke the Zoom. It was so good. We yeah, broke sorry about that, uh, Denise. Do oh, you want me to tell you one more story? Oh, yes, please. Cause sorry, absolutely. So, so uh, you know the way I was saying. So Mark Rylance came up. I had just yeah. mentioned him, and then he get. So when I was out of work and I was in a really bad way, I did The Artist's Way, this yeah. amazing thing. And in it, you have to uh, make a vision board. So I made a vision board. And on it, I had a picture of the National Theatre. I had a picture of an Olivier Award, not for the award, but to represent success yeah. in theatre. I had a picture of Anne-Marie Duff, because she was always a big inspiration to me. And I had a picture of like a film set and then I had Oprah Winfrey in the center because Oprah is like the queen of everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so on my second audition for People, Places and Things, I was as prepared as I could have been. And I was in the National Theatre uh, in the green room and I decided, fuck it, I, I'm not going to sit here nervous or freaked out. Uh, I had seen on the list downstairs the, the other two actresses that were on the list and I was like, they're both really good. So it's anyone's game. And I since I then found out when I got the part that I was the only actress they saw twice. So actually I had made up yeah, that yeah. on the list it was the three of us anyway so I decided I'd go and stand on the balcony uh, and look out at the river and on the way there was a big bookshelf full of plays and I just ran my hand along the books and stopped on a book and have I got it here yeah and it was Oprah Winfrey this I know this what I know for sure and I opened it at a certain 
and a page, just a random page. And she was talking to Dr. Maya Angelou, who's also like a huge inspiration for everything and everyone, I believe. And uh, and the, there was a little passage that said, you know, I called her and I was really upset about things and things weren't going my way. And she stopped me and she said, Oprah, you need to be thankful, be grateful for everything you have in your life right now. And I remember looking at the book and thinking, well, I would have really appreciated if you had shown up in person, Oprah, but this is quite a good beginning. And, uh, and then I did the audition and got the part that day. But within a year, so then I move, I go into the national and uh, I have a dressing room and, uh, the, the guy who looks after all the dressing rooms comes to me one day and he said, so Denise, uh, there's another show in rep and we've run out of dressing rooms. So we need you, if you wouldn't mind, will you share this room? So when you're not performing, another actress will take over. And I was like, yeah, of course. And he said, so Anne-Marie will move in when you're not here. So <laughs> I was like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. So on my dressing room at the National Theatre was Denise Goff and Marie Duff. So within a year of this vision board, I had been nominated for an Olivier, was working at the National, sharing a dressing room with Anne Marie Duff, and I had been given the film Colette. And that, and Oprah. Do you know what? If ever there was a place to finish an interview, it's there it's with Oprah. You, you can't know, get better than Oprah. But you know what, though? I think from chatting to you, never underestimate the power you have to recognize those things because that could happen to so many people, but they wouldn't recognize the book. They wouldn't put those pieces together. Do, do yeah, you know oh, for me, they're everywhere and they happen so much in my life. And the more you recognize them, because it happens to everybody, but the more you recognize them, like I have another thing with these Alaskan husky dogs and I'd always see them when something quite intense was going on in my life, I'd always see a husky dog. And I, the day I had done my second audition, I was in a car with my friend Dickie going to the theater and I said to him, fucking hell, I haven't seen a husky dog. I haven't seen a wolf dog. I call them wolf dogs. I haven't seen a wolf dog in a really long time. And we were driving through Islington and we stopped at a, a walk whatever that thing is you can tell yeah. i don't drive yeah zebra crossing yeah and somebody walked across the zebra crossing with two of those wolf dogs and then my phone rang and i picked up the phone and it was samira my agent and she said do you want the good news or the bad news and i said the bad news please and she said there isn't any we're going to the national and i was like fuck it hell. Okay, so, uh, what you have to promise me is you have my email. If you notice anything tonight, just email me to warn me if, if anything's going to happen to me tomorrow. Yeah, or there's anything. so much stuff. There's yeah, so just, much stuff going on. Yeah. <laughs> Denise, thanks so much for uh, taking part in this. It's been an absolute, what a pleasure. An absolute joy. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Anytime, anytime at all. It's so good to talk to you, Mark. Keep up the good work.